Hello, everyone. Welcome. Can you hear me okay? Excellent. Um, my name is Philippa Hawker, um, and I'd like to acknowledge that we meet on the lands of the Wurundjeri people and the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to elders past and present. I would very much like to welcome Jonathan Rosenbaum here. I'm sure he needs no introduction, but it's, it's a great pleasure to have him here at MIF. He's been here as part of Critics Campus as well, which has been a terrific opportunity for young writers to work closely with someone like him. He's a writer and a critic whose contribution over the years has meant a lot to many, many people. And I'm really happy to be able to talk to him uh, today and for, to, for you to have the opportunity to, to listen to him as well. Um, now, Tyson and Lynn here are the Auslan interpreters, so um, uh, nice to have them here as well. Um, I, well. I'm going to talk to Jonathan for about half an hour, and then I really do want you to have the opportunity um, to, to ask questions. But also, Jonathan's quite keen for this to be fairly interactive, and so... If, um, if you want to ask a question in the course of our conversation or just for clarification, please um, put your hand up and we'll get a mic to you because um, I think that's very much the way um, you'd like that to go, isn't it, Jonathan? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's start. First of all, now, you, you're, you, you've come from a cinema background. You've just, just called it a movie-soaked life because you, yes. you, your, your family were... Um, they ran a chain of movies, movie theatres. Yes. But your own, your, in your own sort of intentions, you, you were heading for a, a literary life. Um, can you talk a little bit about those two influences on you, the, the, the movie background of your family, but also your, your desire to, be, to have a literary career and how that affected you as a film writer, as a film critic? Well, um, one thing that's probably pertinent in this in a way is that my father wanted to be a writer and never quite managed. He got stuck during the uh, depression and then he was uh, he wasn't able, able to get teaching jobs and so he finally, for him it was a kind of capitulation to wind up working for his father's business which was the movie theater business. Um, but I grew up in a house full of books. From a very early age I wanted to be a writer and um, and also I had some, some limited, but for me, significant successes when I was quite young. Um, like in junior high school, I won first prize in a poetry, you know, national poetry, uh, junior scholastic writing awards, it was called. And I, and I published, a, I sold this, a one-page story to the magazine of fantasy and science fiction when I was 13. So that, those were kind of things that were, made me feel set up for a literary career, although I never w succeeded in, in selling any other stories after that. So but it was you, kind you of a wrote, short lived. You wrote novels, though. Didn't you? I did write, well, I wrote my first novel in high school, and then I kind of substantially rewrote it when I was in college. And then I wrote one other novel after that. Mm -hmm. um, none of them ever published. Um, and I think to this date, I've only put on my website, where I've included some juvenilia, one chapter from the third novel. I haven't done any, included any other. Maybe at some point I will. I don't know. I'm not sure even how I feel about those uh, novels now. Do, do you think that interest did affect, affect you as a critic, the fact that you, you had that, that sort of literary background, but also that desire to write in that particular way? I'm sure it did. Um, I think one of the things that I think has drawn me to French culture in a lot of ways is that the French attitude towards cinema, at least in many different periods and many different aspects, is seeing cinema as literature by another means. And for, for example, the magazine that I, French magazine that I am uh, have, the only one that I have real ties to is uh, Trafic, which was started by the late Serge Danet. And it's really, a, I interpret what it does as being a literary magazine about cinema. Because for one thing, it has no illustrations except one tiny frame reproduction or, you know, like on the, on the cover. And from the very beginning, it, it had things like the equivalent of things like diary entries, letters, um, things of this kind, which, in other words, 
there was some kind of interest in form and not just in the idea of, because they don't run reviews. It's not, it wasn't sort of like done in terms of, even though they're critical pieces, the whole, I, the, the whole kind of consumption model of you know, reviewing something and so on is not, is not really, unlike something like, say, Cahiers du Cinema or Positif and so on. So I think, I think the literary aspect obviously played a role in how I looked at films and also how I wrote about films, both. When, with, um, with your book, um, Placing Movies, there's a couple of things you say at the beginning about your approach to, um, to reviewing. And one of them is that you think that it is subjective, that criticism is subjective and there's nothing wrong with that. But also that, um, that it's um, going to films and writing about them is a social activity. Yes. Can you can you talk about those two things because they're they're in some ways they they don't seem to hang together, but in other ways they they, well, they I, speak to each other as well. Well, I do think that it's even though I don't believe that objectivity is possible in criticism, I do believe it's very important that one objectify one's subjectivity, which is to say one one reason why I consider subjectivity so important is because it tells you where the positions come from and where the biases even come from. And so that it, um, and the point is, is that there's all sorts of cultural formations that add up to what we call objectivity, which is, and the fact is, that my point is really that objectivity is as much a construction because of the codes of what we call objectivity as, as subjectivity is. Um, as for the idea of it, be, of it being social, I think that's one of the interesting aspects for me about what's happened with online criticism is that it seems to me that film criticism has always been social, but it's social now in a different way from the way it was before, partly because the social aspect before was based on the premise of a lot of people seeing the same films at the same time in the same places. And now it seems to me there's something that's not exactly criticism, but let's say a critical discourse that starts earlier and finishes later, that's not based on the, let's say, the, cons the what we usually call the consumption cycle, which is of course a kind of uh, prison for reviewers because it, it, it usually involves making whatever you're writing about in a given week seem important, even if it isn't important, and then promptly forgetting about it the next week so you can make room for the next film to consume and forget about. Um, whereas it seems to me that when you have this broader palette which exists on the internet, it also makes the idea of conversation much more central to what's going on, and, and, and it eliminates I think ideally even the idea of closure because I think too much of what reviewing consists of is the notion of the first having the first word or having the last word about a given film rather than it being part of a flow and see what I one way you could sort of look at media history is that when I first started going to movies as a child at my family's theaters the usual way a lot of people went to films, and sometimes my, I did too, is you just go to a theater. You wouldn't just sort of check the time it was starting well, necessarily. Yeah, yeah you just walk in, and you wouldn't even necessarily notice what was, what was on. And you would stay till you reached the same point again, you know, like in terms of the cycle, and then leave. So it was like a kind of a flow. Cinema was like a kind of flow. It wasn't, it was, uh, and then after a certain point when television took over, television had the same sort of flow, that would people just would turn on the television without necessarily looking for a particular program to watch television mm -hmm. and do channel surfing. And now today you've got channel surfing, which is, I mean not channel surfing, but uh, you know, cruising on the internet, which is the same idea too. And the idea that it's an, and, and the part is once you become part of this flow, rather than it's signaling a particular event when you're writing about something. It seems to me that by its very nature, that already becomes more social in a certain kind of way. 
the, the, when you were first writing about films, um, just not so much because the, the idea of the, the cycle of, of, of weekly film, but also um, you'd be writing about films that you couldn't assume that your audience had actually seen. That you know that that it, that would be true, wouldn't it? That that you know that some of the that a lot of the essays that you wrote, for example, in in um, um, in, in your in your first, that we corrected in your first book, you you didn't think that the, your your the people reading your essays would have actually seen those films. Whereas now, the capacity to actually access films is so much greater. It is, but I think it it all depends because sometimes when you're writing about a film, it is important whether the readers see the film or not. Sometimes it isn't, certainly in moving places. I know when people tell me about my first book, which is like an experimental autobiography of sorts, that, it, um, that, you know, that they felt that they had to see th you know, the films I chose to write about, which were also partly arbitrarily chosen, and, and I didn't feel it was necessary at all. There were things like a Doris Day musical on Moonlight Bay and a film called Bird of Paradise that also came from the early 50s. Whereas I think obviously, but that wasn't criticism. That was more something closer to a kind of literary writing, I suppose. And that which reflected the sort of things that, that you were experimenting with, like y your literary background in a way. Yes, and yeah. it was also, it was, I conceived of it at the time, probably very innocently and maybe even foolishly, as a kind of detox journal that I thought I was going to be getting out of criticism and into a literary career by writing this book, not realizing that when the book came out, even though it was came from a, you know, a big publisher, they didn't advertise it. They wouldn't allow me to advertise it, and it wound up in the film sections of bookstores, not in the front of the bookstores. You know, like with the, uh, with the literary books. So that it that, that it the only I wound up in the ghetto in spite of my own intentions, and I found out the only way I could make a living was by being a film critic. <laughs> after that, even though I'd been a film critic before, so by default, and now I don't regret it, but there was a time when I did because it was, it was again, it was not something I exactly chose for myself. Yeah, yeah it, it chose you yes. somehow or other. Yeah, yeah. One of, I, I certainly think of you as someone that I read on the internet in a way because of your time at the Chicago Reader. You became um, very accessible on the internet quite early. Which is kind of it's interesting. Really. Yes, and, and it was incredibly fortunate for me because I succeeded uh, one of the best of all American film critics, I think, at the Chicago Reader, who was Dave Kerr, who more recently has left criticism to be an archivist uh, working for Museum of Modern Art. Yeah, and he came to Melbourne last year right. and, to, and to bringing a couple of Alan Dwan films for the Cinematheque, yeah. yeah. But, but the interesting thing was is that though I didn't choose it at all, that, that it happened this way, when the reader started putting its reviews online, they went back to the beginning of when I started to write, but they didn't go back further. So none of Dave Kerr's pieces for the reader were online, with a consequence that I think that a lot of his very wonderful body of work was kind of lost until very belatedly a collection came out called When Movies Mattered, although I think one of the ways that his position differs from mine is that he puts that in the past tense. <laughs> you know, it's sort of like this, this lost golden age. And he has a second volume that will be coming out, I think, next year. And I just, before I came to Australia, I was invited to write the foreword to it. And they're still trying to think up the title, but I think it's called something like Movies That Mattered, so it'll also be still, in the past still tense. Still in the past tense. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but... but uh, but I do think that that describes partly the difference between Dave and me, even though I think we're very close in our taste in a lot of things. But, and in, in terms of, yeah, your, your internet presence, we were talking before and you were saying that you felt that, um, inter that Australia had quite a, um, a pioneering role in, in internet coverage of, of film. And I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about that because I'm not sure we, we necessarily think of ourselves in that way. And I well, but I, th I think to me it, when I was asked to write a few years ago a piece called Film Writing on the Internet, or on the web, I think it's called. Um, and I looked up and I found out, I can't remember the exact dates, but the uh, screening the past started quite early and it was followed a year later by the founding of uh, uh, Senses of Cinema. Mm -hmm. 
And to me, the best ever online film magazine, to me, it has to be Rouge, I think. And to me, those are three real landmarks. And then if you look at the best film writing on the internet today, it seems to me that the, probably unconsciously, they hark back to those examples in some ways. And I, and I think that that's what's really interesting is that there's always a need in criticism to historicize, even if it becomes an effort to historicize the present. But people are very reluctant to historicize the internet. And I, this is just a kind of a amateurish attempt to sort of say that I think a lot of things started here. And the reason why they started here is very obvious, I think, that Australia is isolated from the rest of the world. And this became a gesture of outreach of a way that writing and thinking about film could reach the rest of the English-speaking world without the Australian twang, <laughs> actually. And, uh, and consequently, I think it's, um, it's really, it becomes really important. And I actually think that there is, I don't, not that I know it very well, but it seems to me that there's a certain literary culture here too that uh, is quite distinctive and uh, different from other literary cultures. And I, and I think that the coexistence of those two, two things has, has borne a lot of some very interesting fruit. I mean, some, one of the most interesting innovative critics to my mind is Leslie Stern, who was not from here, but who lived here a long time here, and uh, who I regard as partly uh, an Australian film critic. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's the example of Adrian mm -hmm. Martin, and that one could cite many other mm -hmm. people. And it's unfortunate that except for screening the, pa except by means of the three examples I cited, Screening the Past, Senses of Cinema, and Rouge, I think the Western world's access and sense of Australian criticism is limited. But I think that that becomes a way, at least of breaking the surface and, and you know, beginning to get a sense of what's there. With um, that, the possibilities that are available for writing on the internet, um, the, the, the communication with other, other writers and the ability to write sort of and have conversations with them is something that you've explored in books as well as on the net. And can you talk a little bit about that, about, about what that, those possibilities offer you both online and, and in print? Well, I think, yeah, and I think there's a third thing, which is audio commentaries oh, for DVDs. Yes, indeed, yeah. And I have consciously resisted doing solo audio commentaries that in one case I did it because I couldn't find somebody else to do it with, but I tend to avoid, the, avoid that because I don't like the idea of a critic sort of becoming, being posing as the expert. That's almost the objective problem that you have then, isn't it? You become the voice of God almost. If yes, it's just that's you. right. Yeah. And, and I think it's, and it's also the idea of even logistically thinking of something to say at every given moment during a film, when, when, when that, that can also be problematic. But on the other hand, if you're having a conversation with someone else, it seems to me that there are many more interesting possibilities. And so I've done Basically, all the ones that I've done are either with Murnau Said Vafa on, we've done with two Kuristami films, and I think we're gonna be doing it with a third for Criterion later this year. Um, I've done two or three with James Nairmore of, on Orson Welles films, and I did one with a uh, American critic named David Kalet on uh, Pritzong's Metropolis, the longer version. So I think that that and I think the idea of dialogue is also interesting. Um, it seemed, I mean, what happened with uh, the book I did with Murnau Said Vaf on Kuristami, for example, is she proposed that we write a book together on, on Kuristami. And it just happened that my friend James Nairmore was starting a book series devoted to filmmakers. And so we proposed it, even though it was a little different in format than what they had in mind. Because I, what our idea, the way we worked it out quickly, is we would write separate essays, then we would have a dialogue together, and then we would both together interview Kuristami. So that it, so that basically it, it wound up being having sort of like three voices, mm. even rather than two, because the interviews with Kuristami were also an important part of that. 
And, um, and of course, interviews were actually supposed to be part of the format, too. But it's just that the idea of the exchange and the dialogue. But it's also happened just by chance and circumstance that a lot of other things I've done are collaborative. Like the first collab major collaboration was a book on midnight movies I did with Jim Hoberman. And that came about because an editor at Harper and Row, who was also at that time the, also the publisher of uh, Moving Places, but coincidentally, it was a different editor. He wrote letters to both Hoberman and me proposing that we write a book on midnight movies. But since I knew Hoberman well enough to know that he had gotten a <laughs> proposal too, I asked him about that. I said, how come you're asking two of us? And he said, well, well why don't you do it together? And so as soon as I had the meeting, because I had the first meeting with the editor, I called up Jim and I said, well, what do you think about if we do it together? And so it seemed like a good idea. And I think it did work out well, because I think it's a stronger book than it would have been if either of, it, either of us had worked on it individually. And, um, and of course, the same principle was at work in um, movie mutations. Well, that's, that's quite a logistical kind of... There's yeah, a and that lot was really interesting. In that book. Yeah. And that was originally started when, I, when the co-editor was Kent Jones, but for various reasons he didn't want to continue with it. So it was taken over by Adrian Martin. And so, yeah, we were doing it, you know, where we were co-editing it from Chicago and Melbourne at the time. And we started it before there was email. So we were actually sending out, because it started out in the form of letters to friends and so on. And then it, by the end of it, we were actually sending out the letters by email. So it actually, during the years that we covered it, was really the, that transition period, which also became important. And I, I think technology always has a role in some of these techniques, because I never would have written my book, Moving Places. Certainly, I wouldn't have written it the same way if I had had access to DVDs and uh, even video at the time I was writing the book, because the idea of these films being almost like inaccessible, except if you just happen to see it on television or if you can take, taping the soundtrack and then playing it back to evoke it. I think it would have been a very different book if, it, if I hadn't had, if, if I had had access to uh, digital viewing as, at the as time. As your writing um, and your, the way you see films changed, uh, you know, as a result of being able to view closely over and over again in a way that you wouldn't have been able to 20 years ago? I'm sure that uh, it does, but it's very hard to identify, you know, in other words, the precise way that it's difficult. What for me is, the way I feel about it that I, that's very important to me, is being able to use a film the way you use a book, or to have a film the way that you to have, have a book. To have it in your possession, on your shelves. To have it in your possession where you can go back and reread things, where you can, um, Bookmark is very important. Bookmarking is a very important aspect of it, too. Um, and so on, where you have a kind of a freedom to roam around in it, basically. Whereas uh, you didn't originally. And so, in a sense, the very fact that you couldn't roam around in it was what made me want to write a book in which I did roam around in the, in the films in a certain way. Yeah, yeah. Can I just, just before we, we um, turn over to the audience, can I just ask you a little bit about, um, about Kira Stami because um, he, he came here um, at MIF in 2003. It was, a, it was wonderful to have him here with a, a retrospective and, it, and there's a real sense of loss that, that, to, that he's, you know, I'm sure you're still quite um, affected by it. And, yeah, and, no, I mean, it's a, devastating. A, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and one thing that's not widely known that I was mentioning to you earlier is that it's not even a debt that was inevitable or necessary, that he had gone into the hospital for a polyp in Tehran, and, but it was during an Iranian holiday and he had to get replacement doctors because the others, the main ones were away on holiday then, and they botched the job. And that's, at least this is what's claimed by his son and by certain colleagues like, uh, Merge, Darius Merjoui has made a public statement about it, and the son is actually suing the hospital or the doctors involved for medical incompetence. And, and part of what was, they were outraged by was the fact that um, he didn't even know how serious his condition was until it was basically too late to do anything about it. Oh, such a loss. So that makes it even worse, but I think it's also, 
that he was, an, a, he was a figure who was in such constant evolution yeah, and can, change that it was like, I, I wrote recently that he had, it's like the one thing he has in common with Godard is they both had as many periods as Picasso. Um, and you never could predict what the next one would be like. Um, and it seems to me that being deprived of the whole latter part of that evolution is part of the great tragedy of that. And part of it is personal. He was a wonderful person. Um, and I miss him in, in that way also. Mm -hmm. Do you, have you written sometimes with that knowing that you're, you like and, and would um, want to be an advocate for a film that no one else likes and you, that's part of, of what you're doing? Um, have you had that experience of writing that way? Yeah, it's happened, but some people say that the reason why I like it is because it's so obscure, <laughs> uh, which I don't think is true, actually, because there are films that... <coughs> although one feels protective of things that are misunderstood and undervalued, obviously, and so that plays a role, I guess. Mm. And, but, I mean, when people said... When people used to criticize me at the reader and saying, why are you always writing about films I've never heard of? I, f I felt like responding, what you really mean is, why are you writing about films that don't have multi-million dollar ad campaigns? Uh, and, the point, and, and in fact, I feel it's more functional to write about films that don't have them because you're all they have. They don't have, the, they don't have all that uh, advertising power you know, to kind of make few people feel that they have to see them. So I think it's... Uh, I mean, surely you, you go to, to, to something like the reader to find out about things that you don't know about rather yeah. than to have, you know, something you already know about, um, you know, served up to you again. Right. But, it, but there's a certain kind of way, it's a, it's a very strange mentality that people judge critics by how much, you know, like what they like corresponds to the box office receipts and things like this. So it's as if, uh, you know, like they... Whereas it seems to me that I, the critics that I've learned the most from are not necessarily the ones I agree with. Um, I think it seems to me any critic that... I mean, one thing I've always loved to kind of cite that was said to me when I once interviewed Jean-Luc Godard, and he said, I want to be regarded as an airplane, not as an airport. And, and I took that to mean people take me to where they want to go and get off. So the destination is not me, it's where they want to go. And it seems to me that that's what criticism should be used for. And you, can, you don't have to use it for the same reason that the critic is using it for. You can use it for your own purposes. And I tend to be, I think, as a critic, a scavenger. I mean, you know, in other words, that if, I, that's why, for example, I like to quote other critics if I think that they help my argument or they help what I, you know, or I feel that they enhance my appreciation of a film. I don't feel that there's any kind of rule against, you know, like citing other critics and so on. Whereas a lot of other people, the, uh, colleagues of mine would never do that because they feel like it's cheating or something. Whereas I just feel, use whatever comes to hand and whatever is useful in making a point. And if that becomes what other critics say, sure, go do, you know, do it. That's, that's my bias. Yeah, sometimes it feels like the, the notion is it has to be yours and your, your opinion and yours only. Yeah. And if, that it's a, some sort of um, contamination if you, if you import the ideas of another critic. I think that's often what people, people are meant... It's just meant to be your voice. Yes. And that's, I think that that's, can often be problematic. But I've, I've always felt that there's a... that the best writers really are ones that convey multiple voices because... I wanted originally, the one thing I didn't get that I wanted to do in Moving Places was to include two short stories by other people and two essays by other people as, you know, as, and embed them in the text and get permission to reprint them and so on. And because it, it was important to me, as even though it was a book about me, I didn't want to feel it was a, people to feel it was a book only about me. And I also felt that what I, part of what I had to say was said by these other people. Um, but uh, I think, in any, in any case, in some ways, writing movie mutations, or rather editing, co-editing, and partly writing movie mutations, was a step in the same direction. Because, and, and particularly because in there, I didn't even know which direction the book was going to go in. 
but I wanted to get on this vehicle that took me somewhere. We're back with those aer aeroplanes again, I think, aren't we? Yeah. Yeah. Um, look, thanks so much to Jonathan Rosenbaum. It's been a real pleasure to have him at the festival and, and, um, and to be able to have the opportunity to talk to him. So please, thank him again. Thank you.